Hello there, Professor Lott. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, so if we're ready to come back now. Just before you join the meeting, I did sort of say to the to colleagues on the call um, who work in a variety of organisations and settings and health and care and beyond across West Yorkshire, that obviously there's a, um, you know, the, the content of the, um, the research and the presentations is really sensitive. And I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to kind of add to that in terms of in terms of the work. Um, no, I, th I think that's right. I think that's right. It's um, it's obviously a, the, the report is, you know, it's 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 stark and sad data. Um, and. You know, it's it, it has been prepared, though, for it, it's on our website as well, so it's been written, um, you know, for for the general reader. Um, so I think that's. That's probably the, the most we can say. <laughs> it's and I think it's important. You, you'll see the message out of my presentation is that suicide in children and young people uh, affects everybody, and that's why it's, it is everybody's business. It's not just uh, you know you, you you'll see it it's it's affects families from all walks of life, um, all over the country. You know no region is 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 different. No age, you know, age group. Obviously, there are differences, but uh, it affects all ethnic groups. So it's 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 um, and 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 also uh, families from from different um, socially deprived backgrounds, but also from affluent backgrounds. So it's it is really is everybody's business. So yeah, so this group of people are really interested in hearing what you research, um, what you, what what you found, and how we can how we can put it into into practice in our in our work with 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 children um day to day so yeah fire away and thanks again for popping in okay lovely hopefully you can all uh hear me um i'm just going to share my slides and it let me get to the slide show is that visible to everybody yes yep okay brilliant so um I'll just introduce myself. I'm the um, uh, Karen Lote. I'm the program lead for the National Child Mortality Database, uh, and the data I'm going to present here today are from um, our first thematic report on suicide in children and young people. Uh, this this uh, is in the public domain, so if you want to go to our website, you can download the report there um, as a PDF file. Uh, the report was published uh, in October 2021. It was our second thematic report um, ever. And the first one on, on suicide. Uh, and we need to acknowledge uh, a long, long list of people. But working on this um, report uh, working group, we, we had uh, Sarah Skelton of Papyrus. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, parent, public and patient involvement as well. So when you read the report, you will see that there are multiple experiences that have been described by um, by individuals. So Ray, for instance, is a bereaved father um, who lost uh, his son Ben through suicide. And he 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 ha has a very um, interesting piece he's written for us on the importance of, of, of what you know, what we're doing and, and reviewing these deaths and trying to make a difference uh, for children in the future. And also S uh, Suzanne Howes um, also reviewed our report, um, helped it make, make, make it more accessible for bereaved parents. And our partner charities on the National Child Mortality Database, the Lullaby Trust Sands and Child Bereavement UK have also given input. Uh, the uh, NCMD um, We'd like to thank all the child death overview panels and all professionals engaging in child death review because it's these data that we've used um, in our report. Uh, the whole NCMD team, uh, we had Professor Louis Appleby, um, he, wrote, he wrote the foreword for us, so please go and look at that. Uh, and we've had, uh, we can, we also need to thank Lem Sisse uh, for granting permission to use his poem in section eight of our report. 
The authors of this report uh, are from the National Child Mortality Database, but we've also had some experts uh, in mental health and suicide. So Professor David Gunnell from the University of Bristol, uh, Professor Pratheba Chitsabian, and uh, Tina Arani, uh, child psycho psychiatrists. We've also had child psychologists involved on the group, and as I've said, the the um, the, the key charities, and also uh, from uh, education, we also had some experts um, involved on the on the reports um, uh, writing group. So the National Child Mortality Database is funded by NHS England. Uh, and it's led by the University of Bristol um, in partnership with others. And we started collecting data uh, into the database now uh, almost three years ago, so 1st of April 2019. And the aim of this um, program is to collate and analyse information nationally to ensure that deaths, all child deaths are learned from, and that learning is widely shared and that actions are taken locally and nationally to reduce the number of children who die in the, fu in, in the future. So that's our main mission. Um, and the, the child death reviews, uh, for those of you who don't know how it works, uh, there is a legal requirement for every child death to be reported within 48 hours uh, to the National Child Mortality Database. And this uh, is embedded in the, Ch in the Children Act. And then following this, this notification, there's a comprehensive multi-agency information gathering process on every child death, including a local child death review meeting with the um, key, key, key members of staff who've, 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 who've worked with that child and family during life. And then uh, all that data is sent up to the national uh, to the child death overview panels who do the final review and, and we collect data from that analysis form from the child death overview panels. And the information that's collected uh, is, is on, in, in statutory forms, and it also includes the views of families. So that the, the NCMD, there is no other database like it uh, globally, uh, the, uh, and that is because we, we have complete data that so there's no opt-outs, every child death is represented in there, and also we, um, we, the, 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 the depth and uh, width of the data we collect is, is, is much more than, for instance, you'd get in the, in the ONS statistics and so on. So when we analyse the data, there are two ways in which we do it. The first is from the 48-hour uh, notification data, so the surveillance data, as we call it. And this gives us uh, real-time monitoring of child mortality in England, and that is how we've been able to also monitor child suicide during the pandemic. And then we also uh, have the, we collect the data that's from the review process, which is, is very, very detailed data. And that's uh, often th this we do in a, in a more qualitative way as well, which gives, um, you know, a very, very interesting angle to, to, to what we do. And for this report, it was it's the same thing. We we collected data on the, the notification cohort. So that's actually the children that have died in the year April 19 to March 2020. Uh, and that you can actually work out rates on that because it's completely population uh, uh, based. And then we've got the review cohort. So these are all the child deaths that were reviewed in that year, uh, 1 April 19 to, to March 2020. And that the and were, were cat, uh, categorised as um, uh, uh, category two death on the statutory form, and that is where um, th these are deaths in children and young people uh, due to suicide. Now, the reviewed cohort, you cannot look at rates because many of these deaths, in fact, very few of them, actually occurred in the year April 19 to March 2020, and that's because suicide deaths or suspected suicides all have to go through the coronial process and that process often takes quite long and that means by the time uh, all the review data has been uh, collected on a, on, a, on a child suicide death that won't be in the same year as as as, as that, that the child died um, so just take note we've got these two different cohorts we're looking at but the review cohort gives you all the detail um, about the antecedent factors for instance so in the notification cohort how it works is every child death gets notified to us 
and every day we have clinicians who code all the deaths coming in the notifications and if a death is classified as highly or moderately likely due to suicide we included it in the analysis and we're saying that they're not definite suicides we're saying highly or moderately likely because these deaths have not yet been through the uh, coronial process but the correlation is quite strong we found so far and then we've actually managed to look at rates of suicide by looking at the um, ONS data on sex, age and region of re residents of all 9 to 17 year olds. So we've put it into the context of the, the population frame. So looking at the, um, the notification data for this year, April 19 to March 20, what you can see, the, these are the, the numbers of notifications that have come in per month. And you can see it varies uh, between five um, suicide deaths per month to uh, peaks at, at you know 12. Um, that, that's the sort of range we're looking at. There were 108 uh, deaths in that year uh, th through suicide. And if we look at the regions um, wh where these um, child deaths occurred, this is the England um, in orange, all England. And um, we express this here as a, a, the, the, the child death rate per 100,000 children living in England. And you can see it's for suicide, it's just it's, it's 1.8 per 100,000 children die through suicide in the whole of England. And if we look at the different regions, we can see um, the confidence intervals are wider because we're looking at lower numbers. And you may think that there are differences between these regions. But statistically, there aren't. So, because all of these confidence intervals overlap, and um, so what that means is um, the the rate is really the same across the country. Uh, it does not matter. It doesn't matter what region you are in. And of course, some regions have more uh, more children living in them than uh, than others. So that's why why you have to adjust for the population of children in that area. And then if we look at the, the age um, ranges, uh, so here on the horizontal axis, we've got the age and years and what you will see and, and the, the colours um, in orange, we have males and in green females. And what you will see is the, the year, the 17th year of, of, of life is, uh, is the highest risk. And, uh, but, you know, by far, there were not 50, 50 young, young people in this age group. So, the 17th year of life up to up to their 18th birthday and you can see more males and females and then the numbers do do decrease uh in the 16th year 15th year 14th year and we actually had 10 children who were 13 or below um which is very worrying i think this is a this is something which has not really been seen before uh and it needs to be an eye kept on this because you know 10 children were ranged between 10 and 13 uh, years of age and there it looked like low numbers but it looked like proportionally you know equal females and males and then if we look at the um, deprivation um, index of multiple deprivation for these deaths uh, the striking thing here is so we, we've looked at we've, we look at the quintiles so so five um, quintiles look, looking for at least deprived here number one to most deprived five um, and what you will see is there's really no pattern here it seems like um, it's not socially patterned so 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 equal numbers in in the most deprived versus the least deprived areas this is also a new finding this has not really been looked at before and that is very much in contrast to every other cause of death in children so this is from taken from our deprivation report this graph here you can see all deaths, um, all causes, and look at this massive social gradient. So, you know, least deprived in orange, most deprived regions in dark green, sorry, light green, dark green. And you can see there's a very, very stark contrast. Um, so deaths in the most deprived areas is, you know, is, is about three times higher than the least deprived. And that's across every single cause of death, except malignancy and suicide. And then if we look at the um, ethnicity, unfortunately, like all NHS data, we've got 
uh, missing data on ethnic group uh, and we all have to work on trying to improve that. So there were 22 out of the 108 deaths where we didn't have ethnic group. Uh, but this is what the um, split looks like. So 68 um, of the deaths were white or white British and 18 were black, Asian, mixed or other ethnicities. Which is about the same as the population um, distribution. So it doesn't look like they're, they're clearly we need complete data, but, but, but it doesn't look like there's a big difference compared to the, the population um, statistics. And then this is a complex table, but what it shows you is the for the first time by age group. Um, so we've we've said that all suicide deaths, the the rate uh, was 1.8 per 100,000 uh, children and young people in England overall. But then we've also split this by um, by age group, and you can see in the 17 year old group that actually amounts to 8.3 suicide deaths in that age group age group per 100,000 children in that age group. So much higher risk there with the increasing age groups. And if you extend this to 25, you'll find it increases every year. Uh, but even, you know, down to age 14, we've got 2.2 .2 per 100,000 children, 15, 2.7 per 100,000, 16, 2.8 and 13 or below, it's 0 0.3 per 100,000. So it's the first time these rates have really been expressed in this way. And there was a statistically significant difference uh, across the ages. Across um, uh, sex also we had differences. So 61% were males, 39% females, and that was statistically significant, the difference. This is this we know from, from, from the past, from NKISH report as well. Um, the, this difference in, in, in sex. And then the regions, as I've said to you, really um, no difference, statistically significantly different between these regions, the rates. They look may look to you as if they're different, but, th but they're not, they all overlap. And urban-rural splits, also no difference really. And then as I've shown you there, the social deprivation uh, data, the quintiles, no difference. So what this means really is that the no matter whether you live in um, urban or rural area, whether you doesn't matter which region of England you live in, and it doesn't matter if you live in a, a deprived or, or or an affluent area, uh, suicide happens in children and young people throughout, with higher risk in 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 males. And then. If we look at the method used, um, that the method of suicide, uh, by far um, the highest number were through hanging or strangulation, um, and then followed by jumping or lying in front of a fast moving object, falling or jumping from a height, poisonings, so this is, is, is using um, and we've taken out recreational drug use here. So if the intent was suicide through poisoning, that, that, that that's what this, this this group means. And then other, me uh, other methods were um, incomplete. And if we look at the, the place of suicide, um, I think this, this is quite important for people to realize, but the by far the most common place is the child's own home child and young or young person's own home and by far the, the, the most common place is the child's bedroom. And uh, so 63 uh, deaths were in the home, 30 in a public place or location of incidents. Uh, and these were uh, schools, colleges, hospitals or other private residences and accommodation is the is the other the other component. So then looking at the reviewed cohort, this is where we have um, much more complete data on the uh, on really the the child's life and their living conditions and their families. Um, and this is taken from a wide, wide sources. So the, the child death notification form, the reporting form, um, there's a supplementary reporting form for suicide or self-harm with very detailed questions. And then the multi-agency uh, CDOP review as well. And uh, that means we have, you know, on every child death through suicide, there's a, a massive amount of uh, of data, inc including free text. 
And the value of using this information is really it's not collected in any other place. So it, it will identify features in the background and social context of the child or young person, which may have contributed to their to their risk of suicide. Um, these data are also submitted um, following the conclusion of the post-mortem and the coronial process. So we actually have the final conclusion whether the um, whether the death was through suicide or not. And we can also use we're also using the CDOG classification of death, looking at modifiable factors. So um, we did a factor analysis where we had um, an experienced child death review um, staff member going through all the cases, pulling out the, the, the antecedent factors. And this was then we did a validation um, method whereby two child psychiatrists also looked at them uh, to, to, to see what the agreement was. And what we've done here is to look at these antecedent factors and, and rank them by, um, by how commonly they occurred. So out of the total of 91 deaths that were reviewed, 81 children or young people had an adverse factor in, in more than one category. And 51 children, so that's 56%, uh, had an, an adverse factor in five or more categories. So you can see that there's this, uh, some, some, some had one and others had, you know, really multiple factors. Uh, and we can't say what the interaction are, uh, interactions are between these different factors, but clearly this needs further research and investigation. But the top one was household functioning, uh, so 69%. And here we had, uh, you know, breakdown in relationships uh, between parents, uh, domestic abuse, um, all of that goes into household functioning families with uh, parents with with physical health problems, mental health problems, quite complex. Loss of key relationships in 62% and I think it's really important to point out here in the past it's always been reported that these losses of key relationships are through bereavements but what we found in in, in this analysis is that these are not just uh, you know, lo losing relationships through to to death. It's it's also where children may have moved fr from a region or moved schools where they've lost their relationships, uh, you know, fr friendships, basically. Um, and I think this is something which we need to focus on in, in the future and for schools to be aware of. And where, you know, where children move into a new area that that really um, it is a potential risk factor. And then 55% had mental health needs of the child or the young person. I'll show you some breakdown of that later. Risk taking behaviors, 49%. Conflict within key relationships, 45%. Problems with service provision, 35%. Abuse and neglect, and this is both physical and uh, sexual abuse. 32%, problems at school, 30%. Bullying, 23%. A medical condition in the child or young person, 23%. Drug or alcohol misuse by the child or young person, 20%. Social media and internet use, 18%. Uh, this is specifically using internet around um, method of suicide and so on. Neurodevelopmental conditions, 60, 16%. And this was a completely new finding. So this is for the first time that we've seen that what this means is 16% of um, children or young people who died through suicide had either uh, were on the autistic spectrum or, or had attention deficit hyperactivity um, as a, a disorder. Uh, so that's an interesting finding that we need to look at in the future. And then sexual orientation, sexual identity and gender identity um, issues in 9% and problems with the law in 9%. So this starts giving you, and what I would encourage you to do is to read the report because we've gone into a lot of depth in, in each of these categories so that you can get a feel for what we're talking about. We've also um, made an infographic showing what this, you know, all these different factors, if you wanted to use this in your in your training, uh, and this is actually available um, on the, you know, as a, P, as a PowerPoint um, image also on the on the website. So just looking at uh, young 
child, children and young people um, in contact with mental health services, uh, you know, only a third were known to mental health services at the time of their death, and 5% were previously known. But what that means is more than half were actually never, were not known to mental health services. 5% were awaiting an assessment, awaiting assessment through CAMS, so that had been referred. Uh, there was 7% 7, 7 there were difficulty accessing or transitioning between services. Less than five um, individuals had disengaged from mental health services at the time of their death. 36% had never been in contact with mental health services. And in nine weeks, 10%, we didn't have enough data to, to classify. So th this is interesting because what that means is we probably are missing a young people with significant mental health uh, risk factors for suicide. Uh, you know, we, we're just not aware because they, they, they're, they're not really engaged with services in any way. So the key findings is that services should really be aware that child suicide is not limited to certain groups. The rates of suicide were similar across all areas and regions of England, urban and rural environments and across deprived and affluent neighbourhoods. And 62% of children or young people reviewed had suffered a very significant personal loss in their life prior to their death, including living losses such as loss of friendships and routine due to moving home or school and other close relationship breakdowns. Over one third of the children and young people had never been in contact with mental health services and, and that suggests that there's an unmet need. And 16% of children or young people uh, had a confirmed diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental condition at the time of their death. So autism spectrum disorders or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this is appears significantly higher than what's found in the general population. And almost a quarter of children and young people reviewed experienced bullying, either at school or cyber. Um, and the majority have reported this at school, highlighting the importance of anti-bullying policies in schools. So learning from the child death overview panels on the themes that were, you know, we extracted, you know, in our qualitative analysis, the, the sort of things that came out was were poor joint working and information sharing between agencies, lack of confidence amongst professionals to talk about suicide with children and young people. The importance of safe and accessible spaces for children and young people to talk about their mental health. The importance of recognising the impact of background social factors on the mental health and well-being of our children and young people. The importance of accessibility to mental health services and the lack of clear policies on bullying and cyberbullying in schools and colleges. And the importance of recognition of challenges for children and young people related to their protected characteristics. And then we have, I'd encourage you to read it there. There's a best practice case study published in the report looking at the, as the Southeast region uh, did a sub-regional um, suicide analysis, from, analysis of uh, uh, young people under 25 uh, and, you know, to look at their findings uh, and recommendations. I think that would be helpful if you're interested in, in, in reducing suicide uh, rates in your own regions. So the report's recommendations are really um, far reaching um, and they are aimed at everyone who's involved in the provision of services for children and young people. And we've recommended that uh, if you work in these services that you study the recommendations are relevant to your sector and area of practice and take action by utilising quality improvement methodologies in your, in your own local area. And really to do this by working collaboratively across agencies um, to ensure a systematic approach. Uh, and, and the case study from the South East England, you know, shows that really, really carefully. So this is about working, you know, between agencies. So health, education, uh, social uh, care, everybody, you know, in an integrated way, we, we need to work together. This is not just a problem for one agency, it's one single agency. And the I'm not going to read through all of the recommendations, but I think uh, it's important if you if you work in these services, you should and see where it's relevant to to yours. I mean, for instance, um, 
number one, to ensure all frontline staff working with children and young people 10 years or over are supported to attend suicide prevention training. And there are some really good, we've got links in there, really good um, online uh, training, uh, you know, just, just a brief um, training module that you can do. And this is about recognising risk, but also about, you know, how to talk with children and young people. In schools, children and young people are talking amongst themselves about suicide all the time. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's no point putting our heads in the sand about this. We, we all need to know how to engage and, 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 and talk with children and young people. And really to improve also awareness on the impact of domestic abuse and parental, physical and mental health needs and conflict at the home. Uh, and also this huge, this focus I think we should be having in schools on, um, you know, identifying children who, who have, have uh, had living losses, uh, really important bullying and also exclusion from schools. These are all really important aspects we've, we've highlighted in the um, recommendations. I'm just going to say a brief, uh, just something brief about the real-time uh, mortality surveillance during the pandemic. We set this up at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic very rapidly um, and we did, we were able to do that because of the 48 hour requirement to notify the NCMD by statute. And uh, that what that means is we're monitoring child mortality in real time and we're reporting to NHS England all the time. And the child death overview panels also have an alert system to, to notify us if they're spotting, for instance, a pattern in a region um, if there seem to be suicides linked, you know, same school, same region, etc., or, or, or new new methods of, of suicide, and we, we we present these data regular trend and signal reporting to NHS England, and right at the beginning in the first lockdown, we spotted a, a, an alarming signal. We thought, and what we did is we compared our suicide rates to the same month of the year before because we had data um you know for the pre for the previous year and we noticed that we thought the numbers were increasing now fortunately numbers are still low so we never reached a statistically significant increase uh but it, it was you know we, we we were onto it quite quickly discussed it with nhs england we did this briefing report um which went to um the secretary of state uh and CMOs and NHS England put in following this, we looked at the patterns and you know the themes that emerged here and and, and, and NHS England put in a, a very strong communication package for families and for uh, you know uh, uh, healthcare workers working with children in mental health. And then fortunately after that we really didn't see much of an, a change compared to the data uh, before, you know, for, for, from the previous year. And we've published that this now, the child suicide rates during the COVID pandemic, um, up to the, these data up to quite recent. And really there is uh, no, there, there's no significant increase in, in child suicides during the pandemic, which is really a relief because I think many of us were worried that this is what we would, you know, potentially see with all the stresses and strains of the pandemic. So if you're interested in our work, please follow us on Twitter at NCMD England. Um, we can, you can visit our website as well. If you want to sign up to our newsletters, we send these out quarterly and you'll know about all our new reports and latest data by, by being uh, on our newsletter list. And then finally, you can also email us on this email. And as I said, this report is, um, if you go to our website, you'll be able to download it.